Hi, everyone. I'm Linda Van Hart, the Visual Arts Coordinator for Common Ground on the Hill. Welcome to week three, Thursday night gallery talk with Alexandra Lane and Carrie Wolfson. They're both teaching photography. They have very different bodies of work. They're both very knowledgeable about many applications that deal with digital photography, but they're very unique individuals and their work speaks to the voice that they have developed as they have developed their skills in photography. Uh, Sasha has been teaching with us two years now and two courses each year. Uh, the first week she taught uh, telling a story through photography. And this week she's teaching Lightroom. Sasha, show us your work, please. Uh, hi, Linda. Hi, Carrie. Hi, everybody. It is uh, nice to be here. Thank you for, for the warm welcome. Um, so this week I've been teaching Lightroom and the theme for this week's Common Ground is perspective. Uh, perspective is an interesting subject because it has uh, multiple meanings. Um, it means a point of view. It also uh, re relates to um, three-dimensional uh, portrayal, uh, sorry, uh, a portrayal of a three-dimensional subject on a two-dimensional surface. And uh, the, the very origin of uh, the word actually is, you could say, in photography because it meant optics. Um, I wrote down here that it actually uh, comes from the word perspectivus in Latin, which means literally to look through. And as photographers, we look through our lens um, in order to capture an image. And then once we have our image, we finish it in, in post-processing in an editing software to make it look like, uh, like what we initially envisioned. And this is where our story that we're trying to say through our photograph actually comes to life. And this is where we can make our photograph really dark or we can make it bright and happy. This is where we can tilt an image and make it look uh, more like more in movement. We can do so many different things uh, in order to convey our own point of view or uh, the story that we're trying to say. So I uh, prepared a little presentation about um, some of the things that I would like to share with you. Um, let me see. I'm assuming you can see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so um, this, is a, uh, this is a picture of the first photograph ever made. Um, it, the author of this photograph is Joseph Nicephorniet. Uh, he was a French photographer. However, looking at this photograph, um, I don't know that anybody would have called him a photographer because photography was not a field at the time. Um, and I can also imagine that looking at this photograph, a lot of people would be dismissive. Um, I don't know how many people would have actually seen any future in, um, in something like this. And I think it's amazing that uh, the, author photograph, uh, the author of the photograph did. Um, if we look at what photography is now, it was born here. It was born in this very picture. Uh, so the leap that uh, we made in those almost 200 years is amazing. Um, of course, the first photographs that were made were not colored. Um, as you all know, they were black and white. And this is a photograph by famous photographer Angel Adams. And the reason why I chose it is that it shows uh, some of his uh, processing techniques, uh, mainly dodging and burning, uh, that were used at the time um, to process photos after uh, they were developed. Uh, so if you can look at uh, specifically at some of the leaves, you can see that they are brighter than the rest. 
And then also you see the shadows that are almost disappearing. He used this technique to obviously to tell the story, to emphasize the beautiful texture of the leaves and to create a little more contrast. So what I'm trying to say by this is uh, even though I am uh, today or this week, I'm teaching Lightroom, which is, uh, which is a pretty modern uh, way to um, edit photos, uh, photo editing is not a new field. It is about as old as photography itself. Um, before colored photographs um, became available, um, it was common to paint over black and white photographs to make them more colorful. This is one of the examples of a ballerina dancing. Uh, if we look at the detail uh, of the photograph, we will see that there are some of the same colors being repeated. And um, the cheeks are very rosy. Uh, the skin is very, I would call it peachy pink. Um, the color, I would say, definitely brought, um, brought the photograph to life. But um, again, uh, technology has moved forward. Either way, I feel like this is a very nostalgic view of, uh, uh, of what photography used to be and very sweet. Um, this is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful photographs ever made. It's called Christina in Red, and the author of it is Mervyn O'Gorman. Uh, it was uh, produced on autochrome plates, which were invaded, uh, sorry, invented by Lumiere Brothers. Um, if you look closely at the photograph, you will see that it's a little grainy in a very sort of creamy way. Um, this graininess was caused uh, by their use of potato starch that was colored and it was used to, uh, uh, to produce the color in the image. Um, as history went on, um, this technique was replaced by a famous line of uh, film called Kodachrome. Uh, I'm sure that everybody recognizes this photograph. It is a photograph of the Afghan girl. And it was uh, made by Steve McCurry in 1984. Um, and obviously by this point, uh, photography has progressed. You see that the definition and the color of the photograph is a lot uh, better or crisper, I would say. Um, and the character of photography has completely changed. Um, the photographs at this point were also made a lot faster. Uh, and um, the, the color gamut of, uh, uh, of the photographs has all, also increased. Um, interestingly, Kodachrome was actually used all the way until year 2010. And as you may suspect, the use of Kodachrome and other films really was then replaced by digital photography. Uh, today, a lot of hobbyists still use um, film, although not Kodachrome specifically, um, for creative arts and just for basically for fun. This is a fun photograph by Annie Leibovitz uh, for a project that she created for Disney. It exemplifies how far photography and photographic editing has come. Uh, the person in the photograph is Russell Brand. Um, he's an actor and he's dressed as Captain Hook. As you see, he is standing in the mouth of a crocodile in a cave and there's a sea or an ocean behind him with the sun coming through. Um, since this is a photograph made for Disney and for children, children may perceive this as reality, but we all know that a photograph like this is not realistic. Well, how is it actually created? This uh, shows the scene, the actual scene that was photographed. You see Annie Leibovitz right here on the uh, bottom right-hand corner. And you see how this photograph was created. So basically the entire photograph, I will go back to it, 
was created after the actual pictures were taken. It was created in photograph editing software of some kind. So it is pretty amazing to imagine that 200 years ago, we were talking about a metal plate um, that barely resembled an image, although the image was definitely there, uh, where a lot of people would be skeptical if such, a, um, such an art form even had any future. And here we are, no, sorry, and here we are 200 years later creating something like this. My next slide is an example of a uh, technique that some people use in Photoshop or in other uh, photographic uh, editing software, uh, which is called HDR. At the bottom, you see three original images. And at the top, you see the final image that the author came up with. So this is basically just another example of uh, how the original image looks completely different from the image that an author can present to their viewers. This image is one of mine. Uh, I wanted to show how uh, we don't have to be Annie Leibovitz, we don't have to be Ansel Adams. Um, we can be ourselves and we can use photo editing software to convey our own view or our own experiences that we have in, in life. And this photograph is from my home country of Slovakia. This is Orava Castle where I went for a trip with my family. Uh, in the original photo, which is on the left, uh, you see the castle being uh, somewhat darkened. At the bottom, there's a street lamp. And um, on the right-hand side, I was able, in Lightroom, I was able to bring more texture to the clouds and more color. I was able to put in more definition to the castle itself. I was able to eliminate the street lamp and give the whole picture a more painterly look. And um, on the right hand side, I see now a photograph that I would love to uh, put up on a wall. This next photograph is from uh, my student, Andy, who is in my uh, Lightroom class. Um, on the left hand side, uh, you see a picture of a jellyfish. It's somewhat monochromatic in that it is blue and it has a little bit of uh, magenta in it. In Lightroom, he was able to change the angle and reframe the photograph so that the composition is a little more interesting. As you see, he was able to bring up more of the detail uh, of the picture. But most importantly, through playing with the sliders, he was able to bring in colors that you originally could not see in the original photo. Um, this is just a, a magic of what you can do in, um, in an editing software, how suddenly you see things that you were not able to see before. And you, you are able to convey the idea, the original idea that you had in mind. This photograph is from my student, Tammy. Um, she photographed a couple uh, that got engaged. And one of the uh, things that she didn't like about the picture was that the posing to her seemed to be a little bland. So in Lightroom, she was able to angle the photograph in a different way uh, so that it brought a little more movement and interest in the picture. This is a photograph by Joanne. Um, it's a picture of her puppy. Uh, when you look on the left-hand side, um, you see the picture a little less defined on the right-hand side, which is the after photo. You see that the colors are brighter, uh, the contrast is uh, a little more evident, and you can, uh, you can see the eyes and the nose a little better. This was a pretty well-framed picture to start with, so there was not much that she had to do with composition, but definitely the colors look a, a lot more interesting on the right-hand side in the after photo. 
This is a photograph by my friend, uh, sorry, by my student Kimberly. Uh, Kimberly um, is working on a photographic project about agriculture. And this photograph documents um, fields and work that is being done on the fields. Uh, you see that on the left-hand side, it's a well-framed and well-done photograph. Uh, but the right hand photograph, which is her after photo, definitely has more punch to it, prettier colors, more definition, uh, there is more to look at. This photograph is by my student Kelly. Uh, Kelly here photographed her daughter dancing. And again, uh, in Lightroom, she was able to give uh, the photograph more punch, more color, and more interest. Okay, um, so, so far I have talked about how we can change photographs so that they convey our message a little better. Uh, looping back to perspective, uh, I would like to uh, mention how oftentimes we as human beings look at the same thing, but as many people as you talk to will have that many different opinions or views. This is a simple photograph of an ocean. It's one of my photographs. Um, I chose a, a you know, up and down uh, composition. And I would like to compare it to other photographs of ocean that I have made and how they convey a completely different message. This is also an up and down photograph of an ocean and it's also somewhat monochromatic but I used a different technique called ICM. And it became a lot more abstract um, and it conveys a completely different message. It has a completely different, different feel to it. And this photograph is also a photograph of an ocean. Interestingly, it was taken from the exact same spot as this previous photo and it was taken under the exact same light conditions. And it was even taken with the exact same settings. I only used a different technique. But it conveys a completely different story. Um, it, it has a completely different perspective to it. This next slide shows a young girl um, it is, uh, this is one of my clients. Um, I was purposefully trying to make this photograph a little more mysterious. I used a lot of uh, dark shades. Um, to me, in this photograph, um, she has a very Mona Lisa-like look to her. Um, but for comparison, I want to show you the same photograph edited in two very different ways where it sends a completely different message. So in this next photograph, it is the exact same shot. She looks, this is a happy photograph. It looks like she tossed her hair. Maybe she is uh, dancing a little bit. Uh, it shows her youth. It shows the summer sun on her face. Um, I will uh, go back again. One and two. So these two photographs show how you can come out of your uh, camera with the exact same image, but through using Lightroom or a, a, a different type of editing software, you can convey a completely different story to your picture. And this is a photograph, uh, this is one of mine. Uh, interestingly, I recently participated in a, in a photo contest and um, just today, just this afternoon, um, I received a message saying that um, this photograph did not win, but it was one of the photographs that the photo contest is going to be publishing. And they, cho they chose it to be published. Um, and the, the theme was florals. Um, since I enjoy taking uh, floral photo photos. I uh, submitted this, uh, this photograph, but there were many other photos and it was a testimony to the fact how, what a variety, what a diversity of opinions there was to the subject of 
the floral photograph. Um, it was really fun to see what type of different um, views people have. There was even actually the winning photograph was actually a portrait um, of a man who had a couple of uh, pic uh, a couple of uh, uh, sorry uh, flowers stuck in his beard. It was a very well done, very painterly photo, and um, it just tells us how it is worthwhile to be always open to other people's perspectives, uh, to be respectful of them and um, to accept them. We don't necessarily need to agree with them, uh, but um, we, uh, it is a good idea to, uh, to take them in and to respect them. And with the last photo in my presentation, I just want to show a photo of a girl looking into the distance. Um, as she is growing, she will create her own perspectives um, and um, it's a picture of my daughter and I only hope that both of my children, as they grow, uh, they are able to accept and respect other people's uh, perspectives as they grow with their own. So this is the end of my presentation. I just want to say that I've had a lot of fun with my students, both in my Lightroom and in my storytelling class. Uh, I hope that they learned a lot. Um, I have to say that I learned a lot from them and I can't wait to teach either or both of these classes in the, in the future again. And now I'm back to you, Linda. Thank you, Alexandra. Appreciate that. Appreciate the, the trip down history's lane, seeing you've represented so many of the changes we've gone through in photography. Um, I believe the one picture of the Afghan girl was on the cover of National Geographic, I'll never forget it, uh, with the complementary colors of the red and green, the focus of her eyes is just, you, you chose really great samples to get across your point. For those of you who saw the last photographic duet between Sasha and Sue Bloom, uh, Sasha was on the, the pure point of view of more shooting straight to tell the story. And in this class, she's obviously enjoyed and taught her students how to artfully manipulate the image that they got to make it the image that they wanted to get to have at the conclusion. Uh, Carrie Wolfson and I were in college together when anything went wrong, we'd sit in my grandmother's rocking chair. He'd sit on my lap if he had something go wrong and I, I'd sit on his lap if I had something go wrong and we got through it. And we're still getting through it sometimes together, looking forward to being together next year. Um, Carrie was not uh, an art major. Uh, he, he is the Red Rooster. Many of you know him as the Red Rooster. He is the moderator of all of our great blues nights, uh, publisher of Blues Access Magazine and uh, blues personality on the radio, uh, a master of, of blues information and uh, was teaching a class called, I think Blues Juke Joint or something. Look for it next year because he works double duty. He teaches classes about the blues and then he teaches classes in our photography uh, media. Uh, and he's also learning Spanish <laughs> at a ripe young age when it's not, not as easy to remember all that stuff, but he's, he's after it. Tell us about your, your art, Carrie. Thank you, Linda. Uh, before I start, I wanna uh, comment that I appreciated seeing Sasha's hand-painted photograph. My, my father was a photographer, a black and white photographer, and I can remember him hand-painting black and white photographs. He, didn't, he never wanted to mess with color because it was too hard to develop. Well, this is my 25th year at Common Ground, which makes me a newbie compared to Linda and Walt, but nonetheless, I've been here since the third year of Common Ground. And I would say for close to 20 of those years, uh, I only was on the music side of things, um, teaching a blues class and uh, hosting 
emceeing the Blues Nights and organizing the Blues Nights. But I really feel like I owe it to Common Ground to help me realize that I'm also a visual artist and that I'm actually not only a visual artist, that I'm an artist, period. I um, got involved in photography back in 2007 when I went to Italy with my first digital camera. It was, it was a camera that you strap around your wrist. And I came back and showed my pictures to friends and they said, wow, you've got a really great eye. You should, you should do more with that. And on top of that, my real good friend, David Paul, who was a fine photographer, said, oh man, you've got to get this software called Lightroom. And so my first work in Lightroom was with I think Lightroom 2.0, and it's gone way beyond that now. So I um, I started getting into digital photography, but I really liked manipulating photographs as much as I did taking good shots. And I managed to teach myself photo, Photoshop and then got help with that with um, as part of a digital study group attached to the photo club that I joined. I'm here in Boulder, Colorado, and um, did that for a long time. And then a few years ago, a photographer I knew had gone to uh, Morocco and he was showing some pictures. He says, you know, I mean, I took my Nikon with me, but I got to tell you, the most fun I had was shooting with my phone, my iPhone. And at that point, I think I had like maybe a flip phone or something. And I went, huh, what's he talking about? So eventually I did get an iPhone. And the more I used it, the more I started to lean into iPhone photography and then into all the applications that you can use to post-process photographs on the iPhone. So what I'm going to show you here is going to start off actually with stuff that wasn't shot on the iPhone, but was fairly quickly move into stuff that was. So these are these are some of my earlier pieces of work. And this is this is the great American songwriter Alan Toussaint, taken in New Orleans, Louisiana, which is where he was from. And I had a challenge with this photograph because as you can see, the background is like completely blown out white. And then between this thing here and whatever, he was having a very green light cast on him. So I decided to do a composite image with this. And this is a picture of my wife, Nancy, at Jazz Fest the same year, and some of the wonderful food booths in the background. And I decided I would put Alan into that scene. So here he is. I, got, I had to cut him out of that image. I had to get rid of the green cast and then fix a few things in Photoshop, just actually kind of painting in some of these lines here and dropped it against this background. This was also taken at Jazz Fest in New Orleans. And this uh, young girl was part of a Mardi Gras Indian troupe. Um, but again, the photo is very busy and I saw a different vi vision of it in my head and came up with this. And she looks a lot more kind of stern and serious in this picture, but uh, it, it all ties together well for me. Now this shot, I'm a, I'm a very avid cyclist and um, I was at a sculpture show in Loveland, Colorado, just wandering through a tent and I saw this and it was it was cyclists. So I took a picture. But as you can see, the whole background is a mess with this. So what am I going to do with this picture? Well, I painstakingly cut out the cyclists from the image, colorized them a little bit more and decided to drop them into a background. This is this is um, in Summit County, Colorado. But I looked this over and went, no, that's not quite it either. 
And I found this photograph I had taken in Sedona, Arizona of a sunset against some beautiful mountains. And suddenly that was it. That was, that was the image. Um, this was in Japan. And how could you not take a picture of this? Uh, this woman pushing their, her kids in this quaint old basket. But again, there was all, all these problems. There's traffic, there's people right here, there's my friend Mark standing right there. So I wanted to do something with this, but I wasn't sure what. And uh, eventually I managed to get it to this point, but then I still had a very large hole in the center. So I decided that this was somehow the lost child and um, that tied everything together. This was at a Chinese restaurant in New York, and you can probably guess that it's a Chinese restaurant just from, from the decorations. And if you look close in here, you can see the photographer and my wife as well. Uh, we were, this was our last meal in New York, and we headed out to LaGuardia Airport, and our flight was delayed, blah, blah, blah. I'm sitting there bored to tears. So I got my iPad out and started messing around with this shot. And I decided to that I wanted to take it to abstraction. And so I ended up with this. And this is done in an app called iColorama and then further on in an app called Percolator. Those of you who have been through Baltimore, Washington International Airport may have seen this um, stained glass crab. I'm also a huge fan of crab. And yesterday was my birthday, and we had crab cakes from GNM and Linthicum flown in so that we could have crabs for dinner, crab cakes for dinner. Um, but as you can see, the picture is really flat looking and needs needs something to make it pop. So this was this was one treatment that I got of it. And then I kept messing with with it some more, got another one that I liked. And just you know, if you if you look at the difference here, <laughs> um, Sasha was talking about making an image pop, and that's what we're doing. So the class that I'm teaching right now is called iPhone Photography, and I have eight students. And you know, if you put them on a scale of experience from zero to one hundred, I'd say that it's from that it ranged from zero to seventy, and yet. I think they're all making great gains in the work that they've shown me. Um, so everything from here on out was done on an iPhone or iPad. I, I often work on an iPad just because it's got more real estate and I can see what I'm doing better. So I was, um, I was riding my bike. This is near Hygiene, Colorado, and I stopped for something and I turned around and I saw these clouds and I went, wow. This is just, this is amazing. And then I was at this, um, what's it called? <laughs> a, um, anyway, it's, it's uh, an old stone building on the edge of the flat irons here, which is the, our backdrop in Boulder. And I decided that I needed to find a way to combine those two images. And so this was the final result of that. Uh, as you can see, realism is not uh, of great importance to me. It's, it's to um, express my own vision, inner vision of what either what I saw, what I saw in a scene or what I thought the scene could possibly be. My friend Norm Sartorius, who's a fantastic woodworker who's been at Common Ground, you may have seen his work. Um, He's sure that it was a result of all the acid that we did about 50 years ago. Now, what's going on here? I've had this happen before. Uh, well, I can't show you the original of this one, but the quarantine uh, really took a, a toll on me creatively. I, I did very, very little shooting in the last 15 months. 
I did very little work on photos in the last 15 months. I just was feeling kind of stifled by, by it all. But this winter, we went out to uh, this place, Wanaka Lake. I don't know what's wrong with that picture there. Uh, um, to go bird watching. And I came upon this scene. Um, the original picture is in color, obviously. But I, these birds are on a shelf of ice. And I just loved the line that this ice made. In photography, we talk about leading lines. And this is, this is a great one because it's not just a straight line. And it leads into an interesting background. So this was one approach that I took to it. But then I kind of ended up with this one that I like a lot better. Um, this was also done, I think, in iColorama. So I, I left my house on a bike ride and got about four blocks and came upon Santa being hauled off to the dump. And I went, wait a minute. <laughs> I've got to take a picture of this. So I snapped this image. But as is often the case when you're just taking a shot uh, that's not being been set up, there's all kinds of stuff going on in the background that you really don't want to be part of your image. So I ended up um, doing a treatment on it like this. This was in El Museo de Arte Prehispanico in Oaxaca City, Mexico. Uh, some really fantastic small statuary there. And I shot this, and as Sasha said, your camera sees colors and it sees the colors that it doesn't necessarily show you when you first look at the image. And you need to process images. I, I honestly, there's no image that I show to anybody on Facebook, wherever, that I haven't done some kind of processing on. And this one was no was no different, but. Look at the difference. At that same museum, I took a picture of this icon and thought, hmm, OK, there's something I can do with this guy. So I used iColorama to accentuate and mutate some of the original um, patina of, of the statue little statuette, cut it out. Meanwhile, I had taken this picture, uh, a rock carving at, um, at a site in Oaxaca, whose name is escaping me for God knows why, because I know it very, Monte Alban. And I um, thought, OK, you know, this ties in with it. And then Around Christmas time, we we decorate our uh, candelabra, chandelier rather, in our dining room. So I took a picture of that, and then I got on my back and shot up at it. And then I cut out all the intervening stuff, process it all together and came up with this. And this is called Cosmogenesis II, the birth of the universe, um, with the whimsical note of having cupcakes <laughs> in it. <laughs> this is another composite image. This is part of a composite image. This was taken at Meow Wolf, which is uh, a mind-boggling art installation in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And in fact, we have one that's over three times the size of it coming to Denver this fall. I can't wait. It's just an amazing place. And this, this was called the Neon Forest. And you actually can like walk right through this. So that was kind of a starting point for this. And then I found some stock images online. Fish, these uh, volcanoes in Indonesia. Started messing around with the volcanoes. Suddenly, they kind of looked like waves on the water. OK, what can I do with that? Well, I can take that image, do something with it. Hmm, OK. No, that's not quite right. Ah, now we're getting, getting somewhere. 
drop in the fish. And this is called Out Upon the Deep Blue Sea Are Sights No Human Eye Have Seen. Just for fun, this was at uh, the Loveland, Colorado Museum, and they had it, they had inflatable art there. So I had my wife take a picture of me lying down next to this giant Buddha. I added in some water and then animated it. Um, this was in Washington. I'm sorry. This was outside of our, this was in Oregon near, near Portland. And I saw this waterfall. I really liked it. I decided to give it a painterly effect, but realized I could also add some movement to it too. So this was done with a, an app called Plotograph. And that's pretty much what I got. As, as Linda knows, I could go on for hours like this, but we'll stop it right here. Linda, take it away. Oh, I gotta stop sharing. All right, sorry. There sorry about that. There we go. Well, thank you, Carrie. That was a real adventure. I think we were on a couple of different continents in a couple of different countries with a couple of different planets. <laughs> a couple of different planets. So our last gallery talk that dealt with photography, there was a very clear distinction between Alexandra and Sue Bloom's work because uh, Alexandra was telling a story and she was capturing it by her technical expertise in using her camera rather than manipulating it. Uh, Sue took us on a journey through uh, how an artist handles isolation in COVID and did a whole series capturing fog. Uh, and manipulated the works were very, very painterly. But tonight, between the two of you, you're using a lot of apps to tell the story that you see in your mind that the camera might not capture. Would you like to comment on each other's techniques? First of all, I would like to say happy belated birthday, Carrie. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I also want to say that I am pretty amazed at what kind of things can be done uh, because absolutely, as I look at your artwork, there is such a high level of creativity in them. The way you uh, transform colors uh, from something that is um, that has muted colors to bright colors, the way you you use lines and all types of curves and uh, textures, and you combine them together, layer them next to each other. I think it is absolutely amazing. And speaking of internal vision or your eyes view or perspective, uh, definitely there is so much to say and so much to see. I think that your work is absolutely amazing. Well, thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, you know, lo looking at your work, I, the fact that, that you started off or fairly early on with a, a photo by Ansel Adams, who of course is a giant, a mega giant, I guess, in, in the field of photography. And you know, those of us who work in the digital realm, uh, I hear, you know, from various people like, oh, that's, isn't that kind of like cheating? And yet, as you pointed out, Ansel Adams did in Darkroom, 
it, amazingly, so much of the kind of stuff that we do now in the digital darkroom or Lightroom. And uh, I feel fairly certain that if he were alive today, he would be diving right in on this stuff because, you know, dodging, burning, it's all playing with light, which um, uh, you, I can't remember the specific photograph of yours, but that was exactly what was happening, where you took something that was kind of a flat image and sculpted it with light. And in my class yesterday, we were talking about that two photographers can stand in the same place and take the same shot. 10 photographers can stand in the same place in the same shot, take the same shot. They're not going to look the same. And the more skilled photographers work will stand, will always stand out. Part of that is because skilled photographers understand that what they add to the picture is, is the secret sauce. And part of that is using light. Photography is all about light. It's about receiving light onto film or light onto the, um, the sensor of your camera, of your digital camera or your phone in my case. And being able to sculpt that light so that it starts with a point of attention for the viewer and leads the viewer into the rest of the image or as you say, in, into the rest of the story. So, um, and we saw that with the Annie Leibovitz image also, where uh, behind Russell Brand in, in the, fifth, the final image that was obviously quite manipulated, but there was a bright light back there that brought you into a cave where this crazy guy in bright red which also draws your eye, is standing astride or agape, <laughs> the, the maw of a giant crocodile or whatever it is. And um, there you have it. Yeah, I think I can see, I'm glad you brought up the Ansel Adams because I can see that dodging and burning techniques. Um, Sasha has a sensitivity to light the one of the castle in Slovakia right. was just, I think that might be the one that you were referring to on the left hand side. It was, it was a nice picture, but it wasn't anywhere nearly as engaging as the one that she manipulated where she brightened the walls of the castle itself and took the sky to a darker tone. Just that much contrast made the whole image pop. What I see in your work, Carrie, that I don't see so much in Sasha's work is the combination of multiple images. Previously disparate, may not have been taken anywhere near the same state. And yet in your imagination, all of a sudden, you see them coming together in this digital montage that creates a uh, something no one has ever seen before. And I believe that one of the differences between the two of you is that Sasha is concerned with storytelling and imaginatively using techniques, but she's more reverent to the original photograph and you're totally irre irreverent to the original photographs. Not not completely, but uh, the um, the picture of the statue in uh, in the museum with that was you know when you looked at the original image it looked almost all white and then when you looked at the uh, finished version there was all this color popping out of it I mean I didn't add that color I found it in there uh, I said at the beginning that. I owe it to common ground for teaching me that I am an artist and accepting myself as an artist, because I always just felt I was kind of a dabbler. But um, 
and in my mind, an artist is somebody who conceives of an idea and then goes about realizing it. That's not always my case. Um, I rely a lot on serendipity. Uh, the, the picture that started with the with the neon forest and the fish and the and the volcanoes. You know, I didn't know what I was going to come out with at all with that. But like I said, well, okay, I manipulate the volcanoes. Hmm, they kind of look like waves on the sea. Well, that leads to the next thing, and that leads to the next thing, and. So I, some of my talent is just knowing when to stop. Well, that's also It's interesting when, when you're dealing with photography, uh, several of us have been talking throughout the three weeks about a sketchbook kind of idea uh, about planning, especially like Keith Taylor with the shaker seats or the baskets. There's so much math involved with that because you have to count for things to work out. Uh, Joanne Bost and I, on the other hand, sit down to a delicious feast of materials. With me, it's metal. With her, it's beads or fabric. And we start to play. And, and as we're working, we may have some kind of an idea like bracelet, necklace, you know, something like that. But we're solving problems as we go. Or in my case, working in a series, the question, what if? is a very intriguing question. You know, as I'm working on something, I think, oh, well, what if I did this instead? So after I'm finished the piece that I'm working on, I'll try another one to satisfy that what if question. Does that what if question come up in your work? Well, what if? What I would like to add to that, Linda, uh, you just described the process of creativity when one idea builds upon the previous one and then the next one comes layered on top of it. And when you compare the beginning um, source or the beginning product and your end product, they end up being something completely different. You might start out with beads and pieces of fabric, but what you end up with is a piece of artwork or you, you start up with a, a piece of metal and you come out with a beautiful piece of jewelry. Same thing goes for Carrie. I agree that it is pretty um, amazing and I can't find any other word for it. That you use photographs, not, not so much for the sake of photographs, but it's a source of a shape or of color or texture. And then you pull a photograph that you took somewhere completely different at a different point in time on a different continent. And do you remember what's where? and what you would like to do with it. And you take those two or three or four things together and create something that simply didn't even exist before. And that's what's so wonderful about the entire process of creativity. You know, um, athletes, high level athletes talk about being in the zone. You know, you're when, a, a, a pitcher throws a no hitter. He says, I was just, I was in the zone all night long. And that is the state that I most aspire to. And it was a, the state that I had the hardest time uh, finding the door to over the last 15 months or so. Just, I was, I was feeling very blocked. And when I get into that state, it's like all my stuff kind of gets out of the way. Um, the, I, th I think I showed you the one of the giant mask, the, the giant white mask. And um, just a second here, let me see if, see if I can find that. Um, I don't, I, okay, oh no, that wasn't, that wasn't in this. Um, Here, let me let me share again for a second here. This was this was a giant mask at a, a place I I went to Photoshop World in Las Vegas and I stayed in a you know casino hotel and somewhere in the lobby this thing was I don't know eight ten feet tall and I took a picture of it thinking. Okay, 
this is going to end up somewhere. So the uh, the night of the inauguration of He Who Shall Not Be Named back in 2016, I was just feeling very depressed and very pissed off and got this photo out and started playing around in iColorama. And this is what I came up with. And to me, it just symbolizes an un, an unknowable future, really. And where this all came from, no idea. But um, like I said, I just, once I get into that flow, I'm sure both of you and many of you out there watching this know just what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. You just, the river of creativity, you know, that was dry all of a sudden starts running and you just get out of the way and let it come through. That's what I did during the pandemic. I just said yes to the gift of time. And for four or five months, every day, I'm working on hard armor sculpture. And with the help of a dear friend, I produced about 94 pieces of work, many of which were shown in my two woman show in November. So I, everybody else is cleaning out closets. I'm in my studio. So it was a great gift of time for me. Thank, thank you very much for a lot of information and a lot of wonderful imagery. It was a pleasure to view your individual voices in the world of photography. Tomorrow night, um, I would like to announce that the gallery talk we had planned uh, has changed. We are still going to feature with with the hard work and, and technical expertise of Carol Riley, we are putting together a representation of Edward Gee and his granddaughter, Felicia. We had planned a visit of Felicia going to her grandfather's studio. And fortunately for her, the job opportunity that came up, she took and they made her start two weeks early. We thought it would start next week and she'd have plenty of time. Uh, Felicia is now one of only 21 people in the history of photography in the U.S. Capitol to be named the U.S. Capitol official photographer. So I'm very proud of her. I know she's in a very stressful place right now driving to DC all day and learning the ropes and figuring things out. Um, and we wish her well. Uh, we will have a small presentation so that you know who these people are. Felicia Gee won the Joyce Scott scholarship last year, could not attend in person, but did a fantastic gallery talk please go online to the official YouTube site. You can see it in total. It's a full hour presentation of and about Felicia Gee. What we will show you tomorrow will be something different than that. So hopefully it will extend your knowledge if you've already met Felicia. And we're hoping she's putting in a request right away for a week next summer so she can be with us teaching as an artist. She is a performance artist, photographer, and videographer, and just an amazing, amazing young woman. Um, her grandfather in the 60s and 70s was one, if not the only artist of color working as a commercial designer, um, cartoonist, character artist in Baltimore, and is still even with visual problems working as an artist today. So he's a a groundbreaking talent and the two of them have a very incredible relationship. So join us tomorrow, if just for a little while to learn a little more about them. And I've collected a lot of information that I'm going to uh, ask Maria to post on the website with the gallery talk so that you can go online and see even more of the, the amazing work of Edward and Felicia Gee. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, please use the same access uh, to come into the concert at eight o'clock. See you there.
Good night.